Welcome to another edition of the magazine. Today we're here with Our Lady's Haven and we'd like to welcome John Rogers and Piper Silver. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So tell us what you do here at Our Lady's Haven. Um, I'm the administrator here at Our Lady's Haven. I've been here for about two and a half years now. So, you know, the administrator oversees the facility with all the other disciplines and kind of runs the show. So um, it's been a pleasure to be. It's a beautiful facility. Um, it's an older building, but uh, just I love the neighborhood. I'm from Somerset. So when I first came to Our Lady's Haven and saw all these beautiful old buildings and fell in love with it, it's a beautiful place. So Excellent. Thank you. Piper, what do you do here? I am the assistant director of nurses. I do staff development, which I help um, you know, bring staff in. I do the orientation um, and I also do infection control. Um, I monitor, you know, of course, COVID, flu, any type of infection control. Um, I've been an infection preventer since 2019 also. So um, that's something I do. And I do oversee one of the floors as a clinical unit manager. Oh, great. Yes. You do a lot. <laughs> she does. She does. I, do. I do. I do. I love it, though. I can't. I, you know, I just to keep busy. I do. I love yeah. it. So, John, can you tell us some of the history of Our Lady's Haven? Sure. Um, Our Lady's Haven at one time was actually a hotel. Um, it was a hotel in the, in, we're not far from Main Street. It was a hotel in this old district, I guess you want to say it. Um, then it was purchased by the Diocese of Fall River. We are one of five nursing homes that the Diocese of Fall River owns. It's us, Marion Manor, which is in Taunton, Catholic Memorial Home, which is in Fall River, um, Sacred Heart, which is in New Bedford, and Madonna Manor, which is in Attleboro. So it was purchased by them, them and the diocese oversees the, the five facilities. So, yeah. It's a great old, old building, as, yes. I, as I keep saying. Uh, it's beautiful. Yeah, the structures are wonderful. You know, we when we have the main, you know, the main dining room here, we do have the uh, the family lounge, you know, and they just, the, it, they don't make stuff like that anymore. <laughs> right, right. They sure don't. They sure yeah. don't. Yeah. So what kind of services do you promote here, Piper? Um, so we do um, rehab services. So we, you know, we get people from outside and they come in and they get rehab. We offer uh, physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy. Uh, we have our contractor with uh, Symbria. They are wonderful. Um, and they come in, they help people get better and they send them home. And then sometimes we have people that, as you know, um, need better care or more care because their family is, you know, moved away or moved on or they've gotten to an age where they need a long-term placement. So um, we provide that. So we do have a floor that has, you know, some dementia on it. We have the other floor that does like more rehab. And then we have a floor that's, you know, long-term where they're here, you know, and we, we provide their services for them. So it's almost like each, we have three units. It's almost like each of the units has their own, yes. their own fla uh, flavor, their own feel yeah. to them, which is nice. Um, and, you know, we'll tend to move residents around to fit what's best for them to right. you know, improve their quality of life right. as much as we can. Yep. You know? As it's needed, sometimes if somebody needs to move to another unit, you know, for either a decline or an improvement, we do. You know, being in long-term care, I've been in 39 years, and I'm not bragging, but, you know, it's nice to see that this facility we realize that we can't cure some of these illnesses. You know, we can't cure the dementia. We can't cure people who come in here with late stage heart disease or renal failure or anything. But it's about giving them as much quality of life as we can in their remaining time. You know, making them happy, making them feel good, hugging them. You know, that is what's key in facilities like this. And you can't always market that and you can't always sure. show that. Um, this facility does a great job with that. Yeah, a social worker has been here 51 years. Wow. 50 she started years. out in dietary. Yep. So she's not that old. She started out at 16. So yep. I'm not going to um, give away her age. Yep. But. And our, our nurses and our CNAs, they're reaching 30, 20 to 30 years. It's wow. a family here. We're all a family. We all respect each other and we treat these residents like they are family. Yeah. The staff here is remarkable. I've been here since 2012. That's when I became um, a nurse. Um, mm -hmm. And before that, I was a CNA. I've worked in long-term care for years and I chose to stay here. Um, I've worked at, you know, facilities around the area and going to Taunton and Fall River and my favorite is here. <laughs> so what are the unique services do you have here? Well, we're also a Catholic facility, um, which, which is great. Um, we have mass three times a week okay. um, at this point. Um, so our residents get to come down to mass. That's huge. That's key. Um, residents love that. 
Sure. We're also a nonprofit facility. And let me explain a little bit, Charlie, if you don't mind what oh, that please, means. Please do. You know, there are many nursing homes out there that are for profit. They have, they've, um, they have stakeholders involved in, in own ownership of the facility. So they're going to want to make money. Mm-hmm. We're fortunately nonprofit. So our goal is not to make money. Our goal is to break even. So that affects a lot of things because some of these for profits, they have to cut certain areas, mm-hmm. whether it be food, whether it be staffing, and that does affect the quality of care in, in, you know, all around. So we pride ourselves in the fact that, as I said, we're not for profit. We have the religious piece. We're mm-hmm. a very homey atmosphere. Um, and, we, and I think people feel that, right? Piper? And I feel, and the thing with us too is that we do promote the religion to the point where if a patient can't go down to mass, we televise it for them in their room. Oh, um, yeah. That also goes for them. So say they're sick or they're not feeling well or they just start in rehab, they don't want to move around a lot. If they want to see the mass, it is on TV. Mm-hmm. Um, and the care here is just, it just speaks for itself. Um, you know, it's, it's a wonderful environment. Um, we are always taking new admissions in. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, when COVID had hit, um, you know, we lost some rooms. We lost some, you know, we had a floor that had uh, been closed down, which that's our goal is trying to get that back open up again so we can just take more you know, people in and, and provide the care that they deserve. Exactly. And you asked about services. We have a beautiful main dining room here. I was just going to say, this is a beautiful dining room. Yes. yes. Unfortunately, we had to shut it down because of COVID. Yeah. We had to listen to the state mandates of, you know, people primarily had to stay in their rooms and be fed in their rooms. So it's it's nice now that we've reopened the dining room. Mm-hmm. It's like a restaurant atmosphere and, yeah. and the residents come down and we treat them like it's a restaurant. So. Yeah, and we play music for them yeah. and they they just love it. They and, do. you know, it's it's we're trying to get back to as, you know, normalcy. Yeah, yeah, as we right. can. Uh, and, yes. yeah. you know, they also felt it. You know, sure. and, uh, you know, some people don't think that, but they did. You know, everyone felt it and those did, too. And activities, too. We had to really cut back on our activities, whether yeah. it be entertained coming into the facility, whether yeah. it be big groups of people playing bingo. We couldn't do it. So they suffered. They really did. Yeah. And now it's nice that you see more you know, smiles. And the weather's nice. They're getting them outside. Yep, they were outside today. And we have Leanne Aegis. She's our director of uh you know, um, activities, and she does such a wonderful job. You know, she brings them out, she takes them for ice cream. So it's we're trying to get back to as normalcy as we can. <laughs> and now you have more room. Yes. So, so you have room for uh, we, more admissions. Uh, and we want to start yeah. accepting more. So, you know, hopefully people will start coming more. Yeah, because a lot of people sometimes don't know, you know, that they usually hear, oh, it's full, it's full, it's full. But you are now accepting more. Oh, yeah. We've been accepting admissions. Our uh, director of admissions is Maria Mello. She's amazing. She's been also here with 20 something years, yeah. if I'm okay. correct. She she oversees a few of us and um, she's at the hospital and she's always getting us people to come in. She does a great job. And, you know, Charlie, we've been in the, in the, in the uh, Fairhaven area for so many years, but I still think that people think of places as a ladies' haven. You know, you come here to die or you come here to spend your remaining time. Mm-hmm. We do rehab, like yeah. I said, hyper mm-hmm. rehab. We, we have a great rehab staff, oh, people, knee replacement, hip replacement. People come here and we get them home. Yep. And they're ecstatic when you send them yeah. home. Just feeling yeah. to thrive. Someone in the hospital that had pneumonia that's been in bed for a few weeks. They come here just to get some strength back and then we get them home. We have rehab patients that come and visit us. We'll bring us donuts because they that just loved so us so great. much. Yeah. yeah. So, it, you know, it, we see that we love that. They come back and visit. And, you know, that's what we want too, you know, because we have great staff for that. Sure. You know? Sure. And it's going to be short term care, like you said. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. And then as they get older, if they do, uh, you know, end up needing long term care, they already know us. They're familiar right. with us. You know, most of the same course. staff, because I've seen a lot of that. I've been here since 2012 and I've seen people that have come for rehab. They end up coming back for long. We also do respite, which is a, a program that not everybody does. Right. So you have a 85 year old mom um, who lives with you. You have to pre- provide the care for her. But you want to go on vacation for a couple of weeks, yeah. you know, and you and your spouse. Yeah. So we'll, t- we'll admit the resident for a couple of weeks. We'll call the respite stay. And they're here for a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we do that a lot. 
many times a repeat customer. Yes. <laughs> oh, we had we have a lady that comes all the time. She's been coming here. I my goodness, for at least six. And I know of six years. The daughter will go away. She'll come here. She stays here for about two weeks. The daughter comes back, and then the one time I remember the daughter. You know, she ended up having to have some type of surgery. We took her mom for a few weeks, mm-hmm. and then she went back. It's wonderful, you know, and they they're comfortable with us. Well, that's the thing. The comfort level is high. It is very high, very high. Yep. You know, being in nursing homes as long as I have, I, I'm a social worker by trade, and I always say families have to have that comfort level. They're placing their loved one in a place like this for us to care for their loved one. If that trust and comfort, comfort level isn't there, think about it. It's like dropping your child off at kindergarten, not trusting the teacher or the school. Or, right. you know? it's, true. it's true. So how would someone get in touch with you? So, well, first of all, if you're at, you know, if you're at St. Luke's or any South Coast, St. Anne's, any type of hospital you're at, all you have to do is ask for Maria Mello. She's the director of admissions. You can actually go online. Okay. Um, you know, we are affiliated with the diocese, uh, and our phone number here that if you ever need it is 508 999 Ask to speak to the administrator or the admissions director, and you leave a message, and we will get back to you. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Well, that's good. So, what other things can you add about this great facility? Well, you know, I, I, it's like, I, I don't mean to keep referring to being in the field for as long as I have, but, you know, we need to be conscious of facilities like this and keep them going. You know, the fastest growing segment of our population right now in this country is people turning over the age of 80. There are some statistics that'll say on a daily basis, there are more people turning over the age of 80 than there are babies being born. Sure. So we better open up the third floor and well, these beds are going to be needed for our, our frail elderly. Sure. And, um, you know, centurions, I was reading an article the other day that says there's uh, 575,000 centenarians, that's people over the age of 100, in the world. And that has quadrupled in the last 10 years. So right people now, living longer, I guess is what I want to say. Yeah. So places like this... Um, we pride ourselves. We want to be around for. We've been around for a long time, and we want to be around. And for we have. We actually have two wonderful residents here right now. One's 103, and one just turned 100, and they're wonderful. Wow, you know, yeah. yeah. So it's it's you know it's the staff in this facility has been has the experience. They've had the experience for years. So you're not coming into a facility with you know people like an overturn of all new people or all new mm-hmm. faces. It's not. You know, we have the same staff we've had for many many years. You'll see some new faces which is wonderful, you know, mm-hmm. but you still see some of the old faces too because they're great and they have the great experience. And by the way, the 103-year-old, yeah, shop is attack. Sure. Oh sure. my God, very right, Piper? Absolutely. And um, it's funny because I've been taking care of her here for years and she's been one of my little spitfires and we come to find out we're cousins. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I said I knew it. <laughs> well, I, I know the quality of care here is amazing and because I've had family members here myself, so I know how the quality of care is here. And I just want to thank you both very much for the great work you do for the community and for being a great part of the Our Ladies Haven family and a part of Fairhaven. Thank you so thank much. You. For your thank time. you for coming by. Thank we appreciate coming. it. Thank you. Welcome back to the magazine. Today we're here with Bob Foster, the president of the Fairhaven High School Alumni Association. Welcome, Bob. Thank you, Charlie. It's nice to be here. Thank you for being here. So tell us some of the background on the Alumni Association. Well, the Alumni Association was founded originally back in 1894, believe it or not, by Henry Huddleston Rogers. He actually went to the original Fairhaven High School on Main Street. So even before he built the current school, he actually was the uh, president of the Alumni Association. But when he passed away in 1909, uh, it pretty much kind of disbanded. Uh, But it got restarted in 1980 by Mary Bettini. She was in the class in 1938. uh, long time uh, community active uh, young lady in town. And uh, she got it started in 1980. And then I succeeded her in 1998. So I've been doing it for 25 years now. Wow, that's great. What, what's the mission? Our basic mission is that we support the students and the faculty and the administration of the high school. And originally Mary's uh, idea of our mission revolved around uh, historical renovation. She was very concerned that the town might not be taking care of Henry Huddleston Rogers School the way she thought it should happen. And uh, 
So for example, those that are familiar with the school, room seven, the most beautiful classroom in the school, which still has the wooden desk, the 102 wooden desks. Uh, we restored that, when I say we, the Alumni Association, back in the mid 80s, uh, totally restored that room, the ceiling, the walls, the floors, had all the dust taken out and refinished. Uh, so that was our first big project. And then the Knight Auditorium upstairs, okay. the beautiful auditorium uh, with hand-carved gargoyles in the ceiling. Uh, we restored that room about three or four years later in the late 80s. So those are the type of projects that originally got us going. Okay. What, what are some of the current projects going on? Well, our latest one that we're very proud of, we just completed in June, uh, was replacing the curtains in the Knight Auditorium. They were probably about 50 or 60 years old and uh, were basically on the point of falling apart. And uh, so we spent 13000 from our uh, treasury to replace those curtains, and it really came wow. out great. So how do you get $13,000? You must have some fundraising efforts. Yeah, uh, we're kind of a unique association um, in that we only have one fundraiser a year. We do a campaign we call the Light of Light campaign. You may have seen the, the Colorado Blue Spruce tree that we have on the west lawn of the high school. Well, we light up one light for every $10 that we get donated to us. And uh, so that tree shines pretty brightly during the season. Uh, that's the only fundraiser we do. We do it all electronically. Uh, we've got a Facebook page and we've got okay. uh, e-newsletters that we send out. And uh, our alumni base are very loyal. I think the nature, the historical nature of our school uh, really makes people feel like they went to a special school. And uh, as a result, for example, last year we raised $43,000. And basically, our fundraisers don't cost us, you know, one percent of that, if that. So all the money we raise pretty much goes right back into the school in one form or another. That's great. And uh, so that's at Christmas time, the light of light. Right. Yeah, we start in October, and then we end uh, at the end of uh, December, right after Christmas. So it goes on for a couple of months. Uh, we have classes. We have a battle of the classes. We call it where we challenge classes to have the largest number of donors. In this past year, we had five classes all from the 1960s that were the top five. Oh, wow. And we gave $2,000 scholarships at graduation in honor of each of those classes. Mm -hmm. So this year, when we start up in October, we're going to challenge some of these classes in the 70s and 80s to try to uh, see if they can get uh, a, a spot in the top five. That's great. Right. So many people love the beautiful building, Fairhaven High School. Is there any way that people can go on tours or you can show tours of the high school? Oh yeah, I've been leading tours now for about 12 years. Uh, we had to take a break during the pandemic. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, since about uh, 2010, I've been leading tours through the school. At first, we just did them on homecoming Saturday. I would do one at 10 o'clock and then another one at 12 o'clock. Uh, but people were so demanding about getting into the building that the school department several years back allowed me to go in five or six more times in, uh, during July. Okay. So they've kind of adjusted their cleaning schedule, the custodians. Right now they're cleaning the addition building. And then I'm doing tours right now uh, the first three Fridays of July. I do a tour at 10 o'clock. Uh, that lasts till about noontime. And then after that, the custodians will be cleaning the building. They'll have about another month to clean it before school starts again. But I'll give you an example. On homecoming Saturday, I did a 10 o'clock tour that had 72 people on it. And then I did a 12 o'clock tour. We had 60 people. Wow. Uh, and it's all types. Some of them are alums who are bringing in their kids or their spouse, trying to show off their school. Uh, sometimes it's uh, people from town who moved into town in their work life and uh, drive by it all the time and are really curious what it looks like inside. And uh, it's funny because they know it's a school. They know that kids go to school there 180 days a year. And I don't think they're expecting it to be as beautiful as it really is inside. Right, yeah. So where do people meet up for the tour? Uh, we meet actually in the addition to the building, which is right in the front. It's got the big stairway, uh, staircase leading up to it. Uh, in what we call the rotunda. 
Uh, the rotunda is that pointed building. It kind of looks like an English tower. And the architect that put the addition onto the school, if you want one of the stories that I tell uh, when I start the tour off, uh, when they built the school, some of the old timers like me remember there was an addition back on Lodge Avenue that was separate from the school. It was actually a tunnel that went from the old gym uh, to the uh, addition. And that's how you got there. Uh, when I was in school in the 1960s, it leaked like a sieve. Mm -hmm. So on a day where you had hard rain, uh, you'd be dodging the uh, five-gallon buckets that were lined up in the top, uh, tunnel. Uh, the addition was built in the 1930s, and a lot of people thought that due to Henry Huddleston Rogers' covenant that he left the town, uh, when he left his buildings to the town, uh, he got them to agree to certain conditions. And the feeling was, I know I was on the school committee back in the 1970s and 80s, and we understood that you couldn't add an addition onto the school because of that covenant. Uh, so when it came time in the 1990s, when the high school was put on academic probation, when it came time to put an addition, they really wanted to put an addition up against the school. One of the factors was because there was no elevator in the school. And it was becoming, the school got a waiver, much like the town hall got a waiver for years, because they were on the National Register of Historic Places. Those waivers went out the window uh, because of the ADA, the American Disabilities Act. They were forced to do it. And uh, in the high school with the granite walls, it was impossible really to put an elevator anywhere. So what they ended up doing was they got permission from the trust. The uh, Rogers heirs have a trust in New York, mm -hmm. and the attorneys there are in touch with the uh, current heirs to the Rogers family. And uh, they got in touch with them, and they got permission. Uh, There's kind of a good story that I tell on the tour, which we don't really have time for today, but uh, about how that came about. But So they ended up building the addition, attaching it right to the main 1906 building. The problem they had, though, was the architect... Earl Flansburg, who put, built the addition, had a definite budget that he was given by the town. Whereas the original architect, Charles Brigham, when Rogers gave him his marching orders, he told him to build the most beautiful high school in America. Mm -hmm. and, and he, he gave him <laughs> no budget whatsoever. And uh, so now you have Earl Flansburg comes along in the late 90s, and he's got a budget, and he's got the task of building this under-budget, addition onto this beautiful historic school that's on the National Register of Historic mm -hmm. Places. And uh, so what he decided to do was build that English tower look to be the transition from the old building to the new. Now, he couldn't afford to put hand-carved carved gargoyles or anything like that in the addition, but he put some touches of oak and uh, other things. Uh, some of the marble from the locker rooms, the boys' locker room and the girls' locker room and the original building uh, downstairs on the basement floor actually had marble floors. Oh, wow. So when they ripped those out, uh, because the gym was going to be converted into the new library, when they ripped out those marble floors, they put them in other places to give that same flow of the marble through the building. Uh, so the, the architect did a, did a great job. For those that haven't seen it, those alums that haven't been back there, uh, they took the old round gym, which was the first round gym with a second level running track on it in America. They took that old gym and converted it into the current library because that was one of the faults that the uh, old building had. Uh, they couldn't get computers, online internet computers, in the original library uh, just because the granite walls were so thick. It just wasn't even possible. So now they have a modern library in a beautiful space uh, with a second floor, what used to be a running track that now has uh, learning stations and computer stations up on a second level. So it's pretty cool. It is. So, Bob, you're very invested in Fairhaven. Yeah, you can tell probably. You get, you get me talking about it. And uh, on my tour, sometimes it lasts longer than, uh, than we think because people ask uh, about some of the ins and outs of it, some of the stories. Like I said, I've, I've got a lot more that you don't have time for today. Uh, I've got one. I, we call it the 500-year story. Uh, you want to hear that one? Okay. Well, when I told you about adding the addition onto the school, uh, the, the schools applied for uh, school assistance, school building assistance, which is very common in the state of Massachusetts. But the school assistance building fund is normally given for new construction, like the elementary school, East Fairhaven, sure. and the Wood School. Mm -hmm. 
In this case, they were building an addition onto a current building, which was 100 years old, almost 100 years old at the time. The state doesn't really like to do that. Uh, they'd rather, they don't trust an old building being added onto. They think it's a poor investment. So when Fairhaven applied, they sent down an inspector from the State Bureau to check that out. So the superintendent of schools and the principal gave the guy a tour. And <clears throat> he was a typical bureaucrat from Boston who took the tour, didn't give much away, didn't have much, uh, much expression or anything. They took him all around the old building, showed him all the highlights. He really wasn't in interested in all historical aspects. He's looking at the functionality of this building. So when they got through, he hadn't given away much, much of an opinion about how this was going. And finally, he sat down with him in the principal's office, and he, said, and he said, okay, I've got one problem. He said, I've got a lot of questions on this form that I've got to answer. And there's one box that I have no answer for. Okay. And the problem, the question is, what is the expected length of service time of this building? Mm -hmm. And he said, the problem I'm having is there's no box here that says 500 years. And the superintendent and the building principal looked at each other and said, oh, all right, thank God. Uh, <laughs> the guy was that impressed with the building that obviously it was going to outlast most of the buildings that they were currently building anywhere. Now, and, and it's, still, it's still for a building that's 120 years old now, it, uh, it's still pretty solid. Yes, it is. And I think it's very important for you know, people to hear, too. We, we have some work that needs to be done on the school. And... Uh, it's an investment in our whole community and even a Kushnick community too. Sure. So we really need to uh, invest in our high school and make sure that we, you know, keep it up and, and keep Henry Huddleston Rogers very proud of what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really a commitment that the town made uh, back then when we accepted the building. And the town really has come through. And again, I don't know if your viewers know it or not. You recently had a prop two and a half override attempt here. They had the mass in you know, Fairhaven had the first successful uh, override of Prop 2.5 mm -hmm. in 1997, and it was to build the addition to the school. Uh, Prop 2.5 had passed, I believe, in 1980, 81, around that time. So there have been 18 years since any town or city of Massachusetts had, had done that. But that was the town rallying behind the school. Sure, sure. So what's the future of the Fairhaven High School Alumni Association? The future, you know, we're going to keep doing what we've been doing. We, our alumni base keeps growing. Uh, the e-newsletters I send out periodically throughout the year. Uh, I've got over 1,800 uh, subscribers right now. Our Light Alight fund each year, we seem to be taking in more money. And our alums really uh, are supportive, so we keep looking for more projects. Uh, the new turf field that we've got, which is now Alumni Stadium, yes. uh, we've pur purchased the new scoreboard, which is amazing in itself. Uh, that was a $30,000 project last year. So in the future, we're just going to keep looking for projects like that, uh, mainly in the old building. Uh, but again, whatever the school department needs in the high school, we try to help them out with it. Well, Bob, I can't thank you enough. You've done so much for our Fairhaven community and, and Fairhaven High School itself. So thank you for your great work as president of this organization. And we wish you the best of success. And and keep on uh, doing the light of light. That's great. And uh, just uh, keep up the great work, Bob. Okay. Thanks, Charlie. It's our pleasure. Thank you.